You are about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Fred Allen. Joan Davis. Portland Hoffa. Judy Holliday. Dennis King. Lisa Kirk. Herb Schreiner. Fran Warren. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. So listen, America, the curtains up, America. We're going to fill your parlor full of stars. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at this same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable, Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, I made it. Didn't think I would, you know. This was Virus X week. Uh, not too severe a case. My temperature was perfectly normal, 110. <laughs> but those ghastly medicines they gave me were well, not so much the medicine, the water they made me swallow with it. <laughs> wonder drugs. It's a wonder I drugged myself out of bed this morning. Well, this virus thing leaves you so weakened. When the doctor turned on that little spotlight to look into my throat, I was so weak I could hardly take a bow. <laughs> But I thought I played the whole scene rather well. <laughs> Some of my friends in the theater who came to visit me applauded spontaneously when I had a coughing spasm. <laughs> but wouldn't you know that one of my very best actress friends tried to steal the scene from me? What a conniving thing to do. In the middle of one of my most dramatic coughs, she has a baby. <laughs> But oh well, being ill has its brighter side too. Friends come with little gifts for you. I brought you something, Tallulah. Oh, thank you, Joan Davis. <laughs> uh, here's a tin of chocolates. Oh, you're so sweet, Joan. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You'll find they're gentle and fast acting. Uh, Joan, please. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, let's take it easy. I I'm not feeling my best yet. My, my throat's still somewhat hoarse. Really? How can you tell? <laughs> it always happens. When I tell people I have laryngitis, I get no sympathy at all. Well, I've been sick myself since I came here from Hollywood. Oh, I am sorry, darling. I wish you'd have told me. My doctor's just marvelous. Oh, I had a doctor. He's a theatrical doctor. Charges four eighty a visit. <laughs> Uh, that's with amusement tax, of course. <laughs> yes, and you know, I just had a wonderful nurse. He bathed my brow, catered to my every wish, held my hand. What a wonderful nurse. Sure hated to see him go. <laughs> well, you don't sound as if you were very sick, Joe. Now, my blood pressure reached a high of 42. 42? <laughs> you think that's something? With my blood pressure at its highest, I owe him 13 points. <laughs> And not only that, Tallulah, just think, I have neuritis in every one of my ten fingers. Really? Well, I have neuritis in nine fingers. And in my tenth finger, I have bursitis. <laughs> and besides that, I have a cough I can feel way down in my lungs. Lungs? Who's got lungs? <laughs> and here's something else. Did you know I have a silver plate in my head? I have service for six. <laughs> Top that. <laughs> Five years ago, I died. <laughs> well, I died ten years ago. Yeah, I saw you in Lifeboat. <laughs> and not only... 
only that, but uh, that bit you were doing before about one of your friends stealing your coughing scene by having a baby. Well, I had a cold once in Kansas City, and one of my visiting friends deliberately had twins. <laughs> well, two years ago, when I had my appendix removed, a girlfriend came to see me in the hospital and had triplets. Yeah? Eight years ago, when I was making a picture... A picture in Hollywood, I tripped and broke my ankle, and the director's wife had to take that very minute to have quadruplets. Seventeen years ago, when I was touring one of my plays in Canada, a woman by the name of Papa Dion. I pass. I can't be five of a kind. Is this a private clinic, or can anyone get in? Lisa Kirk, darling. Oh, Lisa, Lisa, we were just standing here comparing ailments. How do you feel? Oh, I'm in good shape. Yes, I see. <laughs> uh, but uh, how do you feel? I'm fine. Oh, Lisa, you know Joan Davis, don't you? Sure, hello, Joan. Hello. Gee, I saw you in that Cole Porter show, Kiss Me, Kate, and you introduced that big hit song, I'm Always True to You, Darling, After an Old Fashioned. <laughs> I, I, I don't think you know it, but I, I was quite ill this past week. Oh, I'm so sorry, Tallulah. Uh, just listen to this. <laughs> Bravo! <coughs> that was beautiful, Tallulah. Simply beautiful. Oh, thank you, my dear. And now for an encore. No, for, for an encore, I will now run my temperature up to 110. A measly 110? Where I come from, that's for newborn babies. <laughs> newborn babies? That's an idea. Ladies and gentlemen, for an encore... Not here, you won't. <laughs> oh, Lisa, how about your song? Well, dear, I feel a song coming on. As delirious a song cue as I've ever heard. Lisa Kirk singing, I feel a song coming on. Meredith Wilson, how about some music, if you please? I remember my days of solitude when it was folly to dream when my heartbeat was not required a great inspired But today my dark cloud is breaking Music deep inside me is worth Coming on, and the morning, yeah, it's a victorious, happy and glorious new day. I feel a song coming on. It's a melody full of the laughter of children out after the rain. You'll hear a tuneful story ringing through ya, love and glory, hallelujah. Yeah, and now that my troubles are gone, let those heavenly drums go on drumming, cause I feel the sun coming on. I feel a wonderful I feel song. The sun coming on. I feel a song coming and on. I'm you. It's a victorious, happy and glorious Story that is ringing right through ya. Love and glory shout hallelujah! Uh, hallelujah. And now 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 and now
God. Let those heavenly drums go on drumming. Cause I feel a song. I feel a song, a beautiful song. Lisa, darling, thank you very much. Your song made me feel much better. I think I'm ready to face life again. Tallulah, can you face me for a moment? I said life, but I'll settle for you, Fred well, Allen. <laughs> Tallulah, I'm certainly glad to hear your feeling, if you'll pardon the expression, your old self again. <laughs> I am a little better, Fred, but I feel a cold all the time. Oh, feeling cold is nothing. Without your glasses, instead of a closet, you must have stepped into a frigid air during <laughs> the evening or something. But tell me, Tallulah, did the doctor give you any shots of penicillin? Did <laughs> he? Yeah. The new ballpoint penicillin? Have you heard of that? Well, I don't know why, Fred, but he gave me five shots a day for a whole week. Well, that's the way to get to the seat of your trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have had a lot of dealings with doctors I remember when I was touring at vaudeville May it rest in peace <laughs> It keeps coming to life on television, though You can't The dance acts are beating it down with their canes again Well, when I was touring at vaudeville I was playing a split week in Walla Walla Three days in each Walla I... <laughs> And I developed Berry Berry a berry in each walla, incidentally. <laughs> and that was 20 years ago. Well, I went to a doctor there in Walla Walla. He came out with a divining rod and found water on my knee. And uh, he gave me... He... <laughs> I only had a divining rod and a bonfire. An old cannibal doctor had a bonfire in the office going. Well, this doctor gave me six months to live. Well, you certainly fooled him, didn't you, Fred? And me, too. <laughs> well, there are two schools of thought on that, Tallulah. Last evening, a mortician beckoned to me from a doorway, but I passed him by. <laughs> Every doctor I go to these days tells me that I ought to lose a little weight around the hips. So he starts by slimming down my wallet. <laughs> You know how it is when you go to a doctor, he feels your purse right away. Well, I have a doctor now. I have a doctor now. Every time I go to him, he gives me another prescription. Well, what are the prescriptions good for, Fred? Oh, they're good for the doctor. <laughs> My ulcer sent his oldest son through Harvard. My high blood pressure married off his daughter at the Waldorf. <laughs> and my sacroiliac sent his wife to Florida. <laughs> and now, frankly, to Lou, I am a little worried about my liver. Why, Fred, has it been bothering you? Well, not yet. But the other day, I saw my doctor's wife at Bergdorf Goodman's browsing through the mink coat rack. <laughs> And I do hope that she finds a short jacket she likes. <laughs> because if she doesn't, I am in for an operation. <laughs> well, in spite of everything you say, Fred, I don't think I've ever seen you looking better. What have you been doing lately? Well, I'm out in the air a lot, running from doctor to doctor, you know. That... <laughs> well, things have been picking up for me, though. As you probably know, I was in radio for 17 years until a quiz show knocked me off. And I accumulated thousands of scripts. And last week, through a stroke of good fortune, I received a very important offer for my old radio script. Oh, that's wonderful, Fred. Does that mean you're coming back to radio? Oh, no, no. This is a private enterprise. I am selling confetti to small towns who have no celebrities returning. <laughs> These small towns can have the band play and throw the confetti around the streets, and that way they can have a big day and they don't even need a celebrity, you see. <laughs> What a way to treat those wonderful jokes in your oh, scripts, yeah. Fred. All those scripts torn into shreds, scattered over the streets, picked up by the sanitation department, bales sold as waste, ground into pulp, 
and converted into paper and made into newspapers and magazines. Well, that completes the cycle because that's where I got the jokes in the first place. So that... <laughs> Well, some things on the printed page last forever, especially if it's written by George Bernard Shaw, one of the great wits of our time. Shaw wrote some of the most brilliant satirical comedy we have ever heard in the theater. This past week, I was going through one of my old theater programs and ran across one of the most brilliant scenes Shaw ever wrote. It's in a play called The Devil's Disciple. We cabled to London for permission to do an excerpt from this fine satirical comedy, and we were fortunate to have secured the services of one of America's and England's finest actors, whose portrayal of General Burgoyne made that evening in the theater so memorable for me. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dennis King. <laughs> the scene, New Hampshire, the time, 1777, during the Revolutionary War, the play, The Devil's Disciple, which title refers to young Richard Dudgeon, American, known as the Devil's Disciple because of his lively disrespect for certain Puritan observances. In the play, Richard Dudgeon has been arrested by the British, mistaken for a Yankee Presbyterian minister, one Anthony Anderson, whom the British would hang as an example to rebellious colonists. As a matter of principle, however, Richard does not attempt to save himself by revealing that he is not Anderson. As our scene opens, the Redcoats prepare to bring Richard Dudgeon to trial. Here we meet General John Burgoyne, whom Shaw describes as age 55 and very well preserved, a man of fashion, gallant, witty, and aristocratically connected enough to have had opportunities of high military distinction. Here is Dennis King in his famous role of General Burgoyne. But General, sir... Major Swindon, I presume? Yes. General Burgoyne, if I mistake not. I'm glad to have the support of your presence this morning. It is not a particularly lively business, hanging this poor devil of a minister. No, sir, it is not. It's making too much of the fellow to execute him. What more could you have done if he'd been an Episcopalian? Martyrdom, sir, is what these people like. It is the only way in which a man can become famous without ability. However, you have committed us to hanging him, and the sooner he's hanged, the better. We've arranged it for 12 o'clock. Nothing remains to be done except to try him. Nothing except to save our own necks, perhaps. Have you heard the news from Springtown? Nothing special, sir. The latest reports are satisfactory. Satisfactory, sir? Satisfactory? Well, I'm glad you take that view of them. Do I understand that in your opinion... I do not express my opinion. I never stoop to that habit of profane language which, unfortunately, coarsens our profession. If I did, sir, perhaps I should be able to express my opinion of the news from Springtown. The news which you have apparently not heard. How soon do you get news from your supports here? In the course of a month, eh? I suppose the reports have been taken to you, sir, instead of to me. Is there anything serious? Well, Springtown's in the hands of the rebels. Since yesterday? Since two o'clock this morning. Perhaps we shall be in their hands before two o'clock tomorrow morning. Have you thought of that? As to that, General, the British soldier will give a good account of himself. And therefore, I suppose, sir, the British officer need not know his business. The British soldier will get him out of all his blunders with a bayonet. In future, sir, I must ask you to be a little less generous with the blood of your men and a little more generous with your own brains. I'm sorry, sir. I cannot pretend to your intellectual eminence. I can only do my best and rely on the devotion of my countrymen. Uh, may I ask, are you writing a melodrama, Major Swindon? No, sir. Oh, what a pity, what a pity. Do you at all realize, sir, that we have nothing standing between us and our destruction but our own bluff and the sheepishness of these colonists? They are men of the same English stock as ourselves. Six to one of us. Six to one, sir. And nearly half our troops are Hessians, Brunswickers, German dragoons, and Indians with scalping knives. These are the countrymen upon whose devotion you rely. 
Suppose the colonists find a leader. Suppose the news from Springtown should turn out to mean that they have already found a leader. What should we do then, eh? Our duty, sir, I presume. Quite so, quite so. Well, thank you, Major Swindon, thank you. Well, now you've settled the question, sir. Thrown a flood of light on the situation. What a comfort to me to feel that I have at my side so devoted and able an officer to support me in this emergency. I, uh, I think, sir, it will probably relieve both our feelings if you proceed to hang this dissenter without further delay. Especially as I am debarred by my principles from the customary military vent for my feelings. Bring your man in. Yes, sir. And mention to any officer you may meet that the court cannot wait any longer for him. The staff is perfectly ready, sir. They've been waiting your convenience for fully half an hour. Perfectly ready, sir. Oh, so am I, so am I, so am I. Ah, good morning, gentlemen, good morning. Sorry to disturb you, I'm sure. It's very good of you to spare us a few moments. Will you preside, sir? Oh, no, sir, I... I, I feel my own deficiencies too keenly to presume so far. If you'll kindly allow me, I will sit at the feet of Gamaliel. As you please, sir. I'm only trying to do my duty under excessively trying circumstances. Who, uh, who is that woman? Prisoner's wife, sir. She begged me to allow her to be present, and I thought You that thought it... it would be a pleasure for her. Quite so, quite so, quite so. Give the, give the lady a chair and make her thoroughly comfortable. <clears throat> Your name, sir? Come, you don't mean to say you've brought me here without knowing who I am. As a matter of form, sir, give me your name. As a matter of form, then, my name is Anthony Anderson, Presbyterian minister in this town. Indeed. Pray, Mr. Anderson, what do you gentlemen believe? I shall be happy to explain. If time is allowed me, I cannot undertake to complete your conversion in less than a fortnight. We are not here to discuss your views. Oh, I stand rebuke. Oh, not you, I sir. Beg your I, 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 I... Oh, don't mention it. Don't mention it, Major Swindon. Oh, Mr. Anderson, any, uh, any political views? I understand. That's just what we're here to find out. Do you mean to deny that you are a rebel? I am an American, sir. What do you expect me to think of that speech, Mr. Anderson? I never expect a soldier to think, sir. Oh, that's awfully good. Oh, that's I advise you not to be insolent, sir. You can't help yourself, General. When you make up your mind to hang a man, you put yourself at a disadvantage with him. Why should I be civil to you? I may as well be hanged for a sheep as a lamb. You have no right to assume that the court has made up its mind without a fair trial. And you're pleased not address me as general. I am Major Swindon. A thousand pardons. I thought I had the honor of addressing Gentlemanly Johnny. I, uh, I believe I am Gentlemanly Johnny, sir, at your service. My more intimate friends call me General Burgoyne. Uh, you will, uh... You will understand, sir, I hope, since you seem to be a gentleman and a man of some spirit in spite of your calling, that if we should have the misfortune to hang you, we shall do so as a mere matter of political necessity and military duty without any personal ill feeling. Oh, quite so. That makes all the difference in the world, of course. Oh, believe me, sir, you are placing us under the greatest obligation by taking this very disagreeable business so, so thoroughly in the spirit of a gentleman. Sergeant, give Mr. Anderson a chair. Now, Major Swin, we're waiting for you. You are aware, I presume, Mr. Anderson, of your obligations as a subject of His Majesty King George III. I am aware, sir, that His Majesty King George III is about to hang me because I object to Lord North's robbing me. That is a treasonable speech, sir. Yes, I mean it to be. Uh, uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, don't you think that this is rather, <laughs> well, if you'll excuse the word, a vulgar line to take? Now, why should you cry out robbery because of a stamp duty and a tea duty and so forth? After all, it is the essence of your position as a gentleman that you pay with a good grace. It is not the money, General, but to be swindled by a pig-headed lunatic like King George... Just silence our silence! Well, of course, that, that is another point of view, isn't it? <laughs> yes, well, my, uh, uh, my position does not allow of my going into that Except in private. But, of course, Mr. Anderson, if you're determined to be hanged, there's nothing more to be said. An unusual taste. However... Shall we call witnesses? What need is there of witnesses? The townspeople here had listened to me, you'd have found the streets barricaded. The houses loopholed and the people in arms to hold the town against you to the last man. But you arrived, unfortunately, before we'd got out of the talking stage and then it was too late. Well, sir, we shall teach you and your townspeople a lesson they'll not forget. Have you anything more to say? 
I think you might have the decency to treat me as a prisoner of war and shoot me like a man instead of hanging me like a dog. Now there, Mr. Anderson, you talk like a civilian, if you'll excuse my saying so. Have you any idea the average marksmanship of the army of His Majesty King George the <laughs> First? <laughs> now, if we, if we make you up a firing party, what will happen? Half of them will miss you. The rest will make a mess of the business and leave you to the Provo Marshal's pistol. Whereas, Mr. Anderson, we can hang you in a perfectly workmanlike and agreeable manner. Oh, Mr. Anderson, let me persuade you to be hanged. Thank you, General. That view of the case did not occur to me before. To oblige you, I withdraw my objection to the rope. Hang me by all means. Yes, will, uh, will 12 o'clock suit you, Mr. Addison? I shall be at your disposal then, General. You have my greatest admiration, sir. Well, nothing more to be said, gentlemen. What a brilliant performance. Thanks first to you fine supporting players, Martin Blaine and Horace Bram. And as for you, Dennis King, come over here, darling. I want to say hello. Hello, Tallulah. Dennis, may I say there isn't another actor in the theater today that we could have got to play that part as... Yes, Tallulah? As cheaply as we got you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tallulah, thank you. Uh, and you'll pardon me pointing this out, I'm sure. But so far, your writers have given me three scintillating, brilliant lines. They are, hello, Tallulah, yes, Tallulah, and thank you, Tallulah. Now, do you mind, darling, if I supply a little gem of my own? Oh, of course you may, darling. Goodbye, yes. Tallulah. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> Come back here, Dennis. I want to talk to you. Tallulah, I am not going to stand here and bandy bad jokes with you about your strange singing voice, about your singularly marital status, or about this decadent, expressionist medium called radio for which you have forsaken the theatre. But, Dennis, I have not... I will not stand here hemming and hawing over this ghoulish career you've chosen for yourself as contrasted with a theatre which gave you birth and nourished you and moulded you into an artist whose colourful character portraits even now hang in the halls of theatrical fame. But, darling, I... I will not hem and haw with these few dismal lines of limp lackluster lunacies you've handed me to read to amuse these gaping stragglers who've wandered into this radio theater <laughs> and for free yet <laughs> Are you quite finished hamming and hawing? <laughs> what I started to say to you before you began that impersonation of Arthur Treacher... Oh, no, not him! <laughs> I was so taken with your performance a few moments ago, I was trying to invite you to play the summer theatres with me this season in a revival of my play, Private Lives. Well, I would rather die. <laughs> you have been listening to this show, haven't you? <laughs> And I don't see why you won't play it with me. After all, last year you were in a play as General Bugoyne. So? This season you're on Broadway in a play called Billy Budd as Captain Veer. So? The way you're being demoted by this summer, you'll be just right for private lives. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, seem sweet, isn't you, Bob? <laughs> You've been listening too closely. <laughs> why won't you play with me, darling? I beg your pardon? In private lives. Oh, I thought that was... Really the case. Dennis, please! Please, try to keep the conversation at the intellectual level of this program. Very well. May I help you down, darling? Uh, <laughs> very clever. About as clever as that young man in the play you just did, choosing hanging rather than shooting. Oh, you would have preferred shooting? Naturally. It is my fondest hope that when I reach 90, I shall be shot by a jealous wife.
have been listening to Meredith Wilson and the big show orchestra and chorus. I'll take just a moment before we continue to say that this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Big Show. This is the National Broadcasting Company Sunday Extravaganza with the most scintillating personalities in show business. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All Star Festival, is brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. By Chesterfield, the only cigarette that gives you mildness plus no unpleasant aftertaste. The cigarette that brings you Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. And by the makers of Anison. For fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. The big stars in this program are Fred Allen, Joan Davis, Portland Hoffa, Judy Holliday, Dennis King, Lisa Kirk, Herb Schreiner, Fran Warren, Meredith Wilson, and his big show orchestra and chorus. And every week, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> Well, darlings, this is our 25th big show, and there are two more to go before we start a new season in the fall. And don't think I'm not looking forward to that summer vacation. I haven't quite made up my mind yet where I'm going. Several people have written in suggesting where I could go. <laughs> but in the summer, I'd prefer someplace cooler. <laughs> I'd like to go to a quiet place where, well, nobody's running off me for autographs, no photographers. No reporter, someplace nobody knows me. <clears throat> Sounds like CBS. <laughs> well, I, I haven't picked this spot yet, <laughs> but I've made up my mind to go away somewhere. You going alone, Tallulah? Yes, I am, Julie. <laughs> so you're still single, huh? <laughs> Judy, darling, this has been a very bad week for me. I was sick in bed and running a temperature, and the only reason the doctor let me out today is because I had to do this show. And I promised my doctor I wouldn't allow myself to get excited or aggravated. So, Judy, will you please lay off the single stuff so I can follow my doctor's orders? I'm sorry, too. <laughs> That's better. Is the doctor single? Oh, Judy. <laughs> trying to look out for your interests. Well, please don't. I'm quite happy the way I am. All I need is a little rest and a change of scene. That's why I'm planning a boat trip this summer. I may go to, uh, oh, to England. A nice Englishman is nice. <laughs> I might go to France. The Frenchman would be nice. I might even go to Tangiers. Tallulah, are you going to marry a tangerine? <laughs> Judy, I am not taking a boat trip to get married. I'm just going for a change. Well, wouldn't that be a change? <laughs> wouldn't it be nice to have somebody to walk the deck with you and stand by the rail and hold your hand? I don't expect to do much deck walking. I'll probably be violently ill the whole way over. All right, so we'll stand by the rail and hold your head. <laughs> and you know what, Tallulah? I got just the fella for you. I'm sure you have. And you've probably got the wedding date set and everything. It doesn't matter if I love him or not. So what if you don't love him? Just don't hate him. <laughs> He's very nice. He's five foot one inch tall. Five foot one? Really, Judy? So he'll grow on you. <laughs> I'll arrange for you to meet him. He lives in Brooklyn. Naturally. <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to get to Brooklyn. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> or maybe your idea is better, too. Getting a European husband, they're much more romantic. They'll treat you as if you're a girl. All you have to do is tell them. <laughs> European men are not for me. American men are the best. Sure, they're the best. But if American men don't look at you, then European men are the best. <laughs> oh, you love living over there, Tallulah. Maybe you'll be an Englishman. 
It'll be so romantic walking along the Thames River. It's Thames, darling. Oh, Thames? Thanks. And you and him riding in your big limousine with a chauffeur, and you say, a Buckingham Palace, please, Gems. It's James, darling. <laughs> well, make up your mind. They certainly are, so I'll make my ocean trip by myself. You can get awful lonely on a boat by yourself. Oh, I don't know. There's always the captain or the first mate. <laughs> well, that's what I say. First mate and then go. Oh, I get it. <laughs> Here's a word from RCA Victor. Last week, the curtain went up on the 75th anniversary of the National Baseball League and the 50th anniversary of the American League. And there's no better way to celebrate than by enjoying at first hand the thrills and the clean sportsmanship of baseball today. Baseball today, it's the American way. Of course, next best thing to a seat in the stands is a seat in front of a 19-inch RCA Victor television. RCA Victor's new extra-powerful picture pickup gives you the best possible reception everywhere. You know, RCA Victor television is most in demand, but here's really important news. RCA Victor 19-inch television is available. It's on display now at dealer stores. So insist on the best. Insist on seeing 19-inch million-proof television by RCA Victor. When you do, you'll agree. Inch for inch, your best buy in television is RCA Victor 19-inch. And while we're on the subject of RCA, this would be as good a time as any to present our next singing star, Fran Warren. Fran is one of the top recording stars of RCA, and she is going to sing her latest RCA smash record. It just so happens it's a tune which was written by our very own Meredith Wilson. It's that bright and gay new spring tune called Here Comes the Springtime. Fran, Meredith, how about getting together on it, darlings? Here comes the springtime and there goes my heart. Falling apart Totally idly Sweet evening breeze Go away if you please Lilacs and smilacs And hand me Fresh morning dew You are soaking me through With feelings that don't understand me After the robins The crickets will start Springtime and there goes my heart Holdly, idly, holdly, idly, holdly, idly, hey Here comes the springtime and there goes my heart Falling apart Only idly made Bluebird Brigade You have sure got me made Pansies and violets I'm loving Panama hat I am flat on the mat You butterflies Gotta quit shot Come here, that was beautifully done. That is a bouncy tune, isn't it, Tallulah? Yes, and you know who sang it for the first time anywhere? I thought I did. You did not. 
Joan Davis and I happen to have introduced that tune on this very program the minute Meredith finished writing it. Why, the ink wasn't even dry yet. Oh, yes, I heard it. Messy, wasn't it? <laughs> what I don't understand is why nobody asked me to record these tunes. After all, my recording of I'll Be Seeing You is a smash record. <laughs> yes, I smashed mine. <laughs> Accidentally, I trust. Oh, of course it was an accident, Lula. You happen to be walking across your Victrola? <laughs> That's right. Oh, Tallulah. Oh, here she is again, a lethal holiday. <laughs> Judy, dear, I want you to meet Fran Warren. Fran, Judy Holiday. Hello. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Fran is a very good friend of mine, Judy. Some friend. She's such a good friend of yours. Why she stand so close to you, looking so young and pretty? Why, <laughs> why thank you very much, Miss Holiday, but I'm not really that pretty. I don't think so either. <laughs> <laughs> but by comparison... Judy! Ah! <laughs> Fran Warren is one of our most popular singers. Yeah, I heard it. Here comes the springtime. Big deal. <laughs> Come on, Meredith. Get your flu. We'll show him. He was the first kid in the neighborhood with a convertible top. <laughs> and then came the war. Greetings. Holy, heartily. <laughs> I worked in a shipyard, and how handsome he was in his uniform. And then when it was over, he said we should get married on his GI unemployment insurance. <laughs> but they turned him down. They said air raid wardens weren't considered veterans. <laughs> well... I didn't see him again for a couple of years until just this spring I run into him again on the street. He was so formal. He tipped his hat 
And a heavy gust of wind came along and blew off his toupee. He was still the only fellow in the neighborhood with a convertible top. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, here are two young men who are always in season, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. Bob, do you realize we only have one thing in common? Hardly enough for a happy marriage, is it? <laughs> What's that, Bing? Chesterfields, of course. We both like them, we both sell them. And we'd better get to selling them now. You know, folks, better tasting Chesterfield is the only cigarette that combines for you mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. How do you know they're mild? Well, you just make our mildness test. You buy them, open them up, and enjoy that milder aroma. Then smoke a Chesterfield. You'll know it's milder because it smokes milder. And Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That fact has been confirmed by the country's first and only cigarette taste panel. So, always buy Chesterfield. Let's sum it up musically. Buy Chesterfield, Chesterfield, the one that proves its case. Yes, Chesterfields are milder, milder, plus no aftertaste. Oh, ho, open a pack and give them a sniff. Then you'll smoke them. Hey, Tallulah. Yes, Joan Davis? You know, Judy and I have been talking about your problem. Now, look, Joan, don't you start that, too. We were talking about spring. Let's stick to that subject. Yeah, but I hate spring. All it means to me is spring cleaning. You know, I had a six-room apartment in Hollywood, and every year comes spring, so one year I cleaned up all the stuff that accumulated and shoved it into the library and locked it up. And the next year, there wasn't any room left in the library, so I shoved it all in the living room and locked it up. And I've been doing it for five years. I now have the cutest little one-room apartment you ever saw. <laughs> the tile is just spotless. <laughs> well, that really went down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> Never should have taken the plunge. <laughs> Well, maybe we'd get a back, better get back to the other subjects. Yeah, it's starting to sink anyway. When it <laughs> you know, uh, Judy and I think that there must be something wrong with your technique uh, because you've got everything a man would want. I have, darling? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, you got money, and uh, you've got... Uh, uh, don't rush me now. I'll think <laughs> You've got, uh, give me time here now. I... Well, they say I'm uh, loaded with glamour. Oh, sure, you're loaded. <laughs> you got money? Joan, money isn't everything. There was a proverb I learned when I was a child. Money is the root of all evil. I knew it backwards. Yes, and evil spelled backwards is live. <laughs> <laughs> so live a little. Spend your money already. <laughs> Spend money. I'll have you know, Joan, this gown cost me $750. $750? Boy, you should cut down on your gowns. And if you cut your gowns down far enough, you could get yourself a man. <laughs> then he'd pay for them, see? I spend my own money. I spent $13,000 on a mink coat. I bought a house in the country for $49,000. It was on sale. <laughs> and I just bought a town car for $8,000. All that money she can spend but 10 cents to call up a fella she can't afford. <laughs> Judy, I never phone a man. How you like that, Joe? She never phones a man. Yeah. A salmon swims all the way upstream to find a mate and she won't walk across the street to phone a man. <laughs> I am not interested in meeting a salmon. <laughs> so they were out of fish in the sea. Oh, all right, I give up. How long can I fight this? Don't fight it, Tallulah. It's bigger than both of us. <laughs> All right, Joe. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, we're going to show you how to call up and make a date with a man. You're going to show me? Why do I have to do this? Don't fight it, Tallulah. <laughs> what about my ego? It's bigger than both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, we'll call up somebody. Anybody. We'll pick a number out of a hat. Uh, Stetson, five, four, two, six, and seven eights. That's a good one. I'll call him. 
Now watch the way I handle this, Tallulah. You gotta be aggressive. Don't take no for an answer. Watch this. Hello? Hello, Fred. This is Joan. What are you doing tonight? Come on over and I'll cook dinner. Roast beef. Uh, no, Joan. I'm sorry, but I'm busy tonight. Well, how about Saturday night? No, no. I can't make it Saturday. A week from Saturday? Look, Joan, I am going to be out of town for a couple of months. I won't be back until July 15th. That's a date. <laughs> and don't forget it now. I've already got the roast beef in the oven. You put the roast beef on now for July 15th? It'll be all right. It's on a low flame. <laughs> I hope you like it rare. Look, Joan, I have to read these straight lines, but I don't have to eat your cooking. Well, then how about taking me to dinner tonight? I have a dinner date. Well, how about later and we'll go to a movie? Uh, I'll be busy. How about nightclub? I told you I'm going to be busy. Well, let me put it this way. How about coming over to my house and we'll neck? I'll be right over. <laughs> you see, simple? I mean, you see, simple. <laughs> What's me, Tulula? The thing to do is confuse him. I'll call up the same guy. Watch how I mix him up. Hello? Who is this calling, please? What do you mean, who is this calling? You called me. Well, you must have the wrong number. <laughs> is this Stetson 5, 4, 2, 6, and 7, 8? Yes. Then you have the right number. Who is this? This is Fred Allen. Fred Allen? Hello, Fred. This is Judy Holliday. I was just thinking about you. Well, just thinking about me? You just called me. <laughs> well, that's how I happen to be thinking about you. <laughs> now, about our date for Friday night. We have a date for Friday night? Well, okay. It's nice of you to ask. <laughs> Where will I meet you? Now, look, Judy, I can't make any dates. Oh. Well, let me put it this way. How about coming over to my house and we'll neck? That's a date. I'll be right over. You see, Tallulah, that's the way to do it. Go ahead. Try it. Oh, very well. But I think you two waste too much time. Get to the point. All right. Get to the phone. Hey, for luck, dial with the fourth finger of your left hand. Dum, dum, da, dum, 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 da, dum. Hello? Oh, hello, this is Tallulah. How about coming over to the house and necking? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Who is this? This is Mrs. Fred Allen. You see, that always happens to me. <laughs> Every day you hear more and more about an incredibly fast way to relieve the pains of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. It's anacin, A-N-A-C-I-N. Now, the reason anacin is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anacin is like a doctor's prescription. That is, anacin contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing anacin tablets from their own dentist or physician and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30, economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Ask for anison at any drug counter. <laughs> Here is Meredith Wilson with the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus playing John Scott Trotter's lovely new tune, Any Town is Paris When You're Young. Meredith, darling, if you please. <laughs> Every 
Every street's a lover's lane where wishing stars are strung. Yes, any town is Paris when you're young. show for you, but we'll take just a moment out here first to let Ed Hurley say... This portion of the program has been brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, by Chesterfield, the only cigarette that gives you mildness, plus no unpleasant aftertaste, the best cigarette for you to smoke, and by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And now to Lula, if you'll ring your chime. Gladly, Ed. This, darlings, is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is the big show, and Tallulah Bankhead is about to introduce her next guest. Now to make the big show a complete ball of fun, here's that long, tall fella with the small town tails, the homespun Hoosier who just mows it in. Here's Herb Schreiner. Hello. Well, Miss Bankhead, after that big send-off you just gave me there, I can't hardly wait to hear what I got to say. <laughs> Actually, I didn't mosey over, though. Uh, I tell you the truth, I come in a taxi cab, which is, uh, well, I didn't figure on doing that. Uh, I'd never do that. I had to this time, though. Oh, well, well, you were afraid you were going to be late, you mean, huh? Well, you see, the wind blew my hat into the cab, and before I could get out of there, the meter was up to half a dollar. <laughs> I figure I'd go along with it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is one place where the taxi meters seem to go faster than the cabs do. Well, I guess you find it costs quite a bit to do this town. Well, it's a pretty big town, I'll tell you that. I know what costs so much, uh, mostly, is these tips. I mean, you get, uh, well, you take the, over to the hotel where I'm staying. They got a fellow out in front there, the doorman, and he's got a kind of a good deal there. He gets between you and something you're going to do anyways, and then he charges you for it. <laughs> he got me this afternoon pretty good. Uh, charged me a quarter just to open the door. I wasn't even going out. <laughs> I wouldn't like that around home, I tell you. Which reminds me, Herb, the last time you were here, you told us some fascinating things about your hometown in Indiana. Are you really from Indiana? Yep, me and all my folks are from Indiana. Oh, except my grandfather. He was born over in Ohio, but he moved to Indiana as soon as he heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> what town are you from down there? I, I may have played it when I was on tour sometime. Well, I don't think so. It's not the kind of town that anybody would ever stop off in. I mean, unless they got on the wrong road or something, and they wouldn't... Uh... <laughs> Well, actually, you see, what they usually do is just roll their windows up and keep going. It was that kind of a town. I doubt if you ever played it, Miss Bankhead. We didn't get any shows. We didn't get uh, plays or operas or... Uh, well, actually, we didn't get nothing. <laughs> but there's enough of it to go around. We all got in on it anyways. Well, that way, I guess nobody felt left out. What, what do you suppose was holding the town back? Well, I think the trouble was we didn't have enough get up and go. Actually, you'd get up, and then there wasn't any place to go anyways. <laughs> so he just kind of lay there. Oh, I think I'm beginning to get a picture of it. I've been through a lot of those towns. I can see the little four corners, a bank on one corner, a barber shop on the other, a statue in the middle of the square. 
Mm, it ain't quite that big, I tell you. We didn't have any bank out there. Actually, we didn't need one either. If you would, uh, anybody would save up any money, they'd use it to get out of town. <laughs> but, uh, and the barber shop wasn't what you thought it was either. Actually, we had a fellow that uh, run the barber shop. Uh, well, he wasn't even a barber. He was, uh, you'd never know it unless he cut your hair, of course. So a lot of us didn't ever uh, think much about it. He was a chicken farmer. And, uh... He'd give you a haircut, all right. He'd uh, dip your head in a bucket of hot water, and then he'd just kind of rip the hair out. <laughs> of course, uh, nobody ever said anything about it. He only charged a dime. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you spoke about the statue. Uh, we didn't even have a statue around there. That's the thing that used to make me feel so bad. Uh, we had a blank spot right in the center of town there where we was uh, figuring on putting one up. But, uh, you know, not having a statue, you couldn't even keep pigeons around there. It was, uh, it was a mess. So what we thought we'd do, uh, we, were going to, uh, we were going to put a statue up for a local fellow that had gone off and got famous, and uh, then he never came back so we could find out who he was. <laughs> and the trouble was, he left us sort of uh, hung up there. We'd already bought the cement, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> We had uh, piled it up in the center of town. It got to blowing around there in everybody's eyes. So uh, we started cussing him out then. You know, he is, uh, well, he couldn't come back now if he wanted to. <laughs> People got so peeved at him there, and, and uh, he, I think he went from a hero to a bum. It was just a, a, it was a shame, too. Well, we had the cement. We thought we better do something. We was going to use a local fella. We wanted to get another hero. We was uh, short on them. Uh -huh. <laughs> we, uh, we could have used the one from out of town But uh, we didn't want to do that We'd have him coming in there on the bum <laughs> So uh, we was going to use this local fella He was a very heroic fella He's kind of a part-time hero He had lots on the, on the uh, I mean, he was actually uh, pretty heroic The only trouble was that uh, he weighed about 300 pounds He's very heavy set And uh, we didn't have that much cement <laughs> So uh, we, we didn't know what to do with the thing there. We, we, uh, we had already, uh, actually, we decided to look for another hero, but uh, this fellow's about the only one we had that could pass for a hero, and he had actually done, deserved it. I mean, I think that, uh, well, you'd probably say, why put that fellow up for a statue? Well, it's a good question, and uh, I'm kind of glad you asked, because i tell you what he did. <laughs> he, uh, he had a kind of a, well, actually, he was a very nice fellow as far as uh, being a hero. He had done two or three different things there. He was... Uh, he was likable, for one thing. I mean, he, uh, and he was kind of eccentric, too. I mean, he was, uh, well, he was drunk is what he was. Uh, <laughs> but uh, i tell you, what, what happened was that uh, he would drink, and even though he had drink, he would get uh, likable with it. I mean, he was one of these fellas, the more he had drink, the more likable he'd get. <laughs> And uh, I never forget this one night. Uh, he was so likable, he couldn't even stand up. And I never forget it. <laughs> it uh, in fact, uh, that was the night That was the night that he did this heroic deed I was about to mention. Uh, you see, we had a big fire that night. It was uh, over at the firehouse. I never forget that either. <laughs> the uh, firehouse had caught fire, and it was a... Uh, it was kind of a shame. The fireman was giving this big party that night, too. It was, uh, oh, it was a swell party. It was a benefit, and the proceeds was to go for a very worthy cause. I remember that. I think they was going to use the money to buy liquor for the next party. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was, uh, oh, and also they were celebrating this new brass pole. They had just got a brass pole uh, put up in the middle of the firehouse, right there in the center where a fella could, uh, well, he'd be laying in bed up there, for example. He could jump out of bed, grab that pole, and slide right down to the card table. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's possible. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know what happened, but while they was doing the celebrating, this fire got kind of out of hand there, and uh, this fellow made a hero out of himself. He rushed into that burning firehouse and rescued the liquor. <laughs> and uh, two girls that they had pouring for them. <laughs> and, uh, well, that put him over. 
<laughs> that put him over, and actually he got all the credit, and the firemen didn't even get a thank you for their work. It was a shame, and I actually think they deserved an awful lot of credit. If it hadn't been for them, I think the whole thing would have burnt down in about 20 minutes. They kept it going pretty near all night there. <laughs> Uh, it was uh, that made that fellow a hero, and you know he was never the same after that. He started kind of getting swell-headed there, like you know, and he was drinking more and more, of course. And uh, he had already drunk quite a bit, but now he was uh, even buying some. <laughs> and uh, what uh, what he did, he, he he got himself. He quit his job, and uh, he was uh, oh, I don't know. They named a sheep dip after him, you know, and everything. And, uh, I think that. Uh, that made him feel like he had gone to the top of the heap or something. I don't know. Just, uh, he got swell-headed, and he raised a mustache, too. And uh, actually, it looked... Uh, we got kind of worried, all of us that knew him. We, we thought we was a little bit worried for fear he might turn out to be a bum. And his folks was worried, too. Uh, so they got him into politics where he wouldn't be noticed. <laughs> You know, uh, I tell you, you've never seen a more honest politician. That fellow, he just seemed to take to that like a, uh, a duck to the water, and, and on top of it, he was just as honest as could be, too. He had, uh, I mean, if he'd get bought off, he'd stay bought. He wasn't shifty or anything. <laughs> well, he did, he did a couple things. It don't sound like he did anything, but, you know, he got in there, he got to be mayor, and uh, we'd had a, kind of a little trouble around town there. We had, uh, well, we wanted a paved highway. We'd been after that for quite a while. He built it, and uh, it was a beautiful road. I mean, I got to say that in all credit to him. It run the full length of his property, and I believe... <laughs> Actually, he did a couple of things. There was, uh, he did one other thing, too. We never got any tourists. Uh, like I was telling Miss Bankhead, nobody ever stopped off there. And uh, he fixed that. He reduced the speed limit to zero, and then he passed the law against backing up. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of backing up, I've kind of got myself here to where I've got to back off and kind of simmer down, but uh, I know that kind of gives you an idea what it was like. Ain't that right? <laughs> Oh, Donna, darling, you're simply divine and hilarious. I know the folks who are entertaining at the Copley Plaza in Boston feel the same way. And now Meredith has one of his famous chiffon arrangements ready for us. The number, Reflections in the Water. Meredith, darling, if you please. <laughs> Reflections in the water when 
summer comes again, the willows will bend and you will surrender. That was his usual chiffon, and quite divine, darling. And while I'm at it, Meredith, I do want to thank you so very much for that wonderful story you wrote about me in this month's TV screen magazine. Oh, Tallulah. Oh, yes, Fred. As I sat here dozing through the second act of your modest little charade, I had a bad dream, and it involved you. Would you care to hear about it? And not particularly, no. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm not particularly anxious to tell it, but if I don't, Something tells me Phil Harris will come on the air five minutes earlier tonight. <laughs> I think the dream was brought on by something I heard earlier in the show this evening, because Judy and Joan were trying to get you married off. You know that part? I think that's what prompted the whole thing, because in my dream, you were married to Dennis King. I'd rather die. <laughs> Promises, promises. All evening you've been promising. <laughs> well, my dream was like one of those daytime radio serials. As the curtain went up, it was an actor's wedding. You were being married at the little Lowe's Delancey Theater around the corner. <laughs> you and Dennis were coming down the aisle. Now, there was no choir, and your two bridesmaids, Fran Warren and Lisa Kirk, were singing the wedding march. To Broadway, remember me to Herald Square. Do you, Dennis King, take this woman to be your awful wedded wife? Oh, excuse me, sir. Yes, Mr. King, what is it? Oh, yes, 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 of course. I beg your pardon, Mr. King. Do you, Dennis King, star of Billy Budd, now playing at the Biltmore Theater on West 47th Street? Matinees Wednesday and Saturday. <laughs> Take this woman to be your awful wedded wife. To do or not to do? That is the question. What is the answer? <laughs> to do. And do you, Tallulah Brockman Bankhead? <laughs> of course I do. Naturally I do. Why do you think I got all dressed up in these white slacks? <laughs> I do. Do you hear me? I do. Uh, I now pronounce you man and wife. Uh, would you mind making that wife and man? <laughs> I'll be a seeing you in all the old familiar places. And so Dennis brought Tallulah to their little honeymoon cottage. Well, here we are, my dear. After you, Tallulah. Easy does it. That's it. Now you can put me down. <laughs> Hello. Good heavens, who is this child? Oh, this is my surprise for you, Tallulah. This is our little girl. Our little girl? Yes, I wanted to save you the bother, so I ordered her from room service. <laughs> Come here, child. Say hello to your mother and father. Hello, Daddy. Hello, Mommy. I'm your mommy. He's your daddy. <laughs> You're just trying to make me neurotic. Ladies, 
ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make an announcement at this time. Although Portland is their child, be it known to all creditors, I do not consider either Mr. King or Miss Bankhead my father-in-law or my mother-in-law. <laughs> now, back to the plot. We may have something going here bigger than just plain Bill. How do you do? And who are you? I'm the governess for the little girl. <laughs> oh, but we, uh, we wanted a couple, a governess and a chauffeur. Now, if you're the governess, what is your husband? He's the governor, that's what. <laughs> All right, governess, you can put the child to bed now. Okay, come on, kid. I don't want to. I want to watch television. Television, how dare you. <laughs> Take her out and wash her mouth with soap and water. <laughs> Honest, I don't know where she picked up that dirty way. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we look in on Dennis and Tallulah again It is now 13 weeks later And they have decided to pick up each other's options For another 13 weeks Dennis, darling, this is our very first anniversary We're having guests for dinner I've invited Joan Davis and her new husband Joan Davis? Oh, no, Tallulah but Why, why? Do you know her? Well, not very well I, I, I think I was married to her once <laughs> Well, darling, who wasn't? Uh, I, want you to, I want you to meet... Um, oh, oh, that's you, dear. Hello, Joan. Oh, Tallulah, how are you? I want you to meet my new husband, Herb Schreiner. Oh, uh, how do you do, uh, Mr. Schreiner? Hello. I understand you just got back from your honeymoon, Joan. Oh, yes, we just came back from Europe on the Normandy. The Normandy? My dear, the Normandy was destroyed by fire at the pier here in New York several years ago. Yeah? No wonder the toast was so burned. <laughs> How you do? I'm the governess. You want the kid to sing a song now? Oh, this is our little girl's governess, and she's taught the child a song. I want you to hear it. Uh, oh, yes, bring her in now, Judy. But first, I gotta introduce her. Give the little kid a big hand. <laughs> no! <laughs> Not in her mouth. <laughs> sing your song, kid. Sing the song I learned you this morning about the white wings. At this point, I must interrupt to explain that I have the only banjo in town that can accompany this child's voice. <laughs> now, when my banjo starts, ladies and gentlemen, do not let it fool you. It's only a banjo, but it sounds like a symphony orchestra. Listen. <laughs> As an arrow, my yacht shoots along on the crest of the sea. Sail home to sweet Maggie Darrow in her dear little home. She is waiting for me. Yo ho, how we go. Oh, how the winds blow White wings They never grow weary They carry me cheerily Over the sea Night comes I long for my dearie I'll spread out my white wings and sail home to thee. Say, that kid's really nothing, isn't she? <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Schreiner, what, uh, what business are you in? Well, originally, uh, I mean, that back home in Indiana, that is, uh, I used to be a window trimmer in a feed store. In a feed store? Well, how do you trim a feed store window? Well, it was kind of an easy job. I just uh, put some clean flypaper in there, and that was about it. <laughs> Sometimes we wash the cat and put him back in there, too. Isn't he clever? Then he went to the general store. Tell him, Herb. Well, that was kind of an easy job, too, actually. I, uh, I'd go over there on Saturday morning, and I'd kind of dust off the penny candy, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> 
And then the uh, fellow that had the store was getting a lot of uh, crackers stole out of the cracker barrel, so he got peeved and he put a snapping turtle in there. So uh, Saturdays I'd go over there and walk the turtle. <laughs> Storekeeper was a bug on cleanliness. <laughs> well, what business are you in now? Well, it's something I've been working on back around home, and, uh, well, it's a self-service funeral parlor. <laughs> Oh, it just never caught on. I don't know if the, uh, I don't think the town is ready for it. Oh, well, they're ready for it. They just don't know it. That's it. <laughs> well, that was life at the Mr. and Mrs. Dennis King's. And now we pick them up 13 weeks later, and another option is coming up. Where were you last night? What time did you get in? Were you out with that Joan Davis, or is it Judy? Why didn't you show up here for dinner? Why do you think I am? What do you think I am? Where were you? Why don't you answer me? Goodbye, we are through. And once again, a 13-week option was not picked up because of a quiz show. Ladies and gentlemen, from the great heart of the American poet Walt Whitman comes an eloquently prideful expression of love for America, an expression which is certainly as timely today as it was many years ago when he wrote it. And thou, America, thy offspring towering e'er so high, yet how are thee above all towering, with victory on thy left and at thy right hand law, thy union holding all, fusing, absorbing, tolerating all, thee, ever thee, I sing. Thou also, thou a world, with all thy wide geographies manifold, different, distant, rounded by thee in one, one common orbit language, one common indivisible destiny for all. And by the spells which ye vouchsafe to those your ministers in earnest, I here personify and call thy themes to make them pass before ye. Behold America, and thou ineffable guest and sister, for thee come trooping up thy waters and thy lands. Behold thy fields and farms, thy far-off woods and mountains as in procession coming. Behold the sea itself, and on its limitless heaving breast the ships. See where their white sails bellowing in the wind speckle the green and blue. See the streamers coming and going, steaming in and out of port. See dusky and undulating the long pennants of smoke. Behold in Oregon, far in the north and west, or in Maine, far in the north and east, thy cheerful axemen wielding all day their axes. Behold on the lakes thy pilots at their wheels, thy oarsmen, how the ash rise under those muscular arms. There by the furnace and there by the anvil, Behold thy sturdy blacksmiths swinging their sledges. Overhand so steady, overhand they turn and fall with joyous clank like a tumult of laughter. Mark the spirit of invention everywhere, thy rapid patents, thy continual workshops, foundries risen or rising. See from their chimneys how the tall flame fires stream. Mark thy interminable farms, north, south, Thy wealthy daughter states, eastern and western, the varied products of Ohio, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Georgia, Texas, and the rest. Thy limitless crops, grass, wheat, sugar, oil, corn, rice, hemp, hops, 
The barns all filled, the endless freight train and the bulging storehouse. The grapes that ripen on thy vines, the apples in the orchards, the incalculable lumber, beef, pork, potatoes, thy coal, thy gold and silver, the inexhaustible iron in thy mines. All thy, O oh, sacred union, ships, farms, shops, Barns, factories, mines, city and state, north, south, item and aggregate. We dedicate, dread mother, all to thee. Protectress absolute, thou, bulwark of all. For well we know that while thou givest each and all, generous as God, Without thee, neither all nor each, nor land, home, nor ship, nor mine, nor any here this day secure, nor aught, nor any day secure. America, America. That's our show for this week, and next week we'll have Milton Berle, Rosemary Clooney, Jimmy Durante, Frank Lovejoy, Gordon McRae, Ethel Merman, and others, and of course, our very own Meredith Wilson and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus. Until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away. Judy? May you find that long-awaited golden day today. Joan? May your troubles all be small ones and your fortune ten times ten. Lisa? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Portland? May you walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. Herb. May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see. Dennis? Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been. Fred? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Fran? May you long recall each rainbow, then you'll soon forget the rain. May the warm and tender memories be the ones that will May the good Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet, till we meet again. Good night, darlings. And God speed to our armed forces all over the world who hear these broadcasts each week. Coming up, Phil Harris and Alice Lane Show. Hear it on NBC.